onto phosphorus for as much negative, you know, that we hear about phosphorus, we can't survive without it. DNA, ATP, you know, just sort of really critical components of our bodies, of our animals' bodies, uh, are composed of phosphorus. So we have to have it. Our animals need to have it. And really, the only areas of the world that are dealing with these kind of issues are areas where there's any kind of animals concentrated within a state. And so when we have too much phosphorus in a landscape, or any kind of nutrient, really, for that matter, it can cause, can cause some kind of issue. In the past, and again, this has changed quite a bit, is that we've had issues in actually supplying phosphorus to our crops. <laughs> the total phosphorus content in our soils relative to other nutrients is, is pretty low overall. Most of the phosphorus is unavailable. For the most part, um, it's either bound to rocks and minerals, or it's held tightly by these nutrients, but a lot of it is not available to your crops. Historically, you know, our, our crops and our fields have been very deficient. And in the past, you know, people have recommended putting on like two to four times the amount of what was actually needed by the crop, just so the crop would get what it actually needed. But even though the crop maybe was getting what it needed, the rest of that phosphorus was sort of getting bound up. And then over time, you just, everything is saturated. Okay, so over time, we've just, we've just put on too much. And then the other thing that happens is that we have uh, manure, whether it's liquid or not liquid, it doesn't really matter. And manure is a really difficult fertilizer to manage because it doesn't have equal parts of nutrients in it. And sometimes we want more nitrogen on a field, sometimes we want more potassium, and we apply that in the form of manure, and we end up with adding too much phosphorus to get the nitrogen that we want. Here's just an example of, of the manure content. So nitrogen, there's 15 pounds of nitrogen available per thousand gallons. And then there's eight pounds of phosphorus available. Your corn requires 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre, and it only requires 40 pounds of phosphorus. You're going to apply manure, a lot of people like to do this, to meet the nitrogen demands of the corn. So to apply 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre, you need to apply 10,000 gallons of manure per acre, right? 15 pounds per 1,000 gallons. If you put on 10,000 gallons, you get 150 pounds of nitrogen. Great, now I don't have to buy any other fertilizers. And nitrogen tends to be the limiting nutrient on most all of our farms. But then what happens is we also applied 80 pounds of phosphorus. We only needed 40. So what happens to the other 40? It stays in the soil, gets bound up by certain nutrients. Some of it stays in the soil solution. But we begin to build up the levels. There's nothing removing it. We're not extracting it from the fields at all. So that's when you start to see your soil test levels go up because you've now applied more phosphorus than what the crop will utilize. And if you do this for 40 years pretty regularly, then obviously over time your soil test phosphorus levels will it be in the, likely be in the excessive range. And this is very, 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 very common, especially on fields that are dry, you know, the ones that are the easiest to get the manure to in the spring, or they're the closest to the barn, or you know, whatever reason, those fields get a lot of manure because it's convenient for whatever reason, and, and likely, however much manure they're getting, it's exceeding what you're removing in that crop. And so then you just get this increase over time. It's a lot easier to increase the levels than it is to decrease the levels. And again, this is just the exact same thing I just showed you. Generally, manure being applied, the nutrients in that, the phosphorus in that, versus what the crop is actually removing, generally is far less. The other issue we have on most of our farms, not all of our farms, some of us actually have the opposite issue. You know, we're importing grain onto our farms. Not everybody. There's a few of us here that don't. And uh, because you're importing nutrients, it's, it's essentially kind of a fertilizer source for you that ends up where the excess ends up in your manure. And on most farms, you're importing far more phosphorus, mainly in the source of grain, than you are exporting in milk. Even with all of our best efforts sitting here today, 
unless everybody stopped feeding grain or grew their own grain or did something slightly different, um, we're not going to prevent the buildup in our soils because we are just as farms out of balance. But in the case of farms that aren't feeding grain, the bigger worry for you is how are you going to continue to maintain the productivity of your forages without fertilizer in a way that comes in in grain. If you're exporting more nutrients than you're importing, then over time your soils could become depleted as well. So it's the, you know, the opposite issue. This work was done in Vermont a number of years ago. Um, and so these are real numbers from Vermont farms. Essentially looking at phosphorus inputs, 65% of phosphorus that comes onto farms is actually in the form of feed, primarily grain, and then bedding, a very small amount in bedding. And then other inputs, much smaller, 35%. And I actually would say that this is even less now because I don't see people using that much phosphorus fertilizer anymore. It's only 35% of what comes on a farm. So most all of the phosphorus that we're importing comes in the form of grain. Of what comes on the farm, in general, we're only exporting about 43% of that, and almost 60% of the phosphorus ends up staying on the farm. Just by the way we farm, we're going to continue to build up these levels. So we can kind of spread it out better, you know, make sure it's getting out to all the different fields. But at some point, and not in our generation, but the next or the next after that, this is really something we should be focused on now. How do we improve the crops that we grow on our own farm so that we can import less phosphorus in the form of grain? Should we be looking more closely at the types of grains that we purchase to minimize phosphorus in the grain? You know, really what we're feeding to our animals has a pretty significant influence on what comes out the back end, obviously. And so just thinking a little bit about how we can manage that, um, I don't know, I don't have the answers, but I mean, this is sort of the, the purple, pink, yellow spotted elephant sitting in the room that we, we have sort of just not even dealt with. So here's um, the phosphorus nutrient cycle. Okay, here's, here's the crop, and the only phosphorus that your crops can take up is in the solution P, which is phosphorus in water, and it's orthophosphate, which is H minus H. PO4 minus. So in order for phosphorus to get into the solution P, it can come from a variety of sources, and so you can sort of see arrows and things pointing um, into the solution P. But we do have lots of manure phosphorus that will make it directly to the solution P. So it's not just phosphorus fertilizer, but we account, you know, for every pound of phosphorus we measure or whatever we measure in your manure, we say that that's all plant available. Okay, organic phosphorus is phosphorus stuck to carbon, so organic matter, and that can easily become uh, available to your crop as well, but you have to have microbial activity in your soil for that to happen. Essentially, a microbe has to chew on the organic matter, release the phosphorus basically into the solution P so that it becomes available to your crop. It's always moving. So when you do a soil test, and that's kind of what this shows, is that the soil test is, is an indicator of what will likely be in the soil solution P, and they kind of separate it out, because there is a chance that whatever came up on your soil test does end up going into one of these other pools. You know, you can't guarantee that what the soil test says isn't going to move somewhere else. Okay? It's completely possible, depending on the environment, the condition of your soil, the amount of microbes that are there. I mean, there's so many factors that a soil test can't know. <laughs> so it's just a chemical extracts out sort of what they think will be available to your crop. So phosphorus is more readily available between 65 and 105 degrees. This temperature does have an impact. And like I said, um, you know, overall phosphorus isn't that mobile. Most of your phosphorus stays up in the top uh, six inches of the soil. And so, you know, the lower down you get into the soil profile, the less phosphorus you have. It doesn't take very much phosphorus at all to cause an issue in the lake. So here's, you know, phosphorus levels in the same units, right, that are critical for crop growth. And then this is the, the phosphorus levels critical for algae growth. And you can see it's so much smaller. So even a tiny, tiny fraction of what you need for your crops, you know, making it into the water can can cause harm to the water.
And I know we've done some projects where we said, ah, oh, it's hardly it's hardly anything. You know, it's such a small amount. You know, we weren't we weren't seeing much come out of the tile line, but not much is too much for the algae. It's not you know enough for your crop, and it's not a big deal agronomically. You know, I think we met for one project. It was like one pound per acre. Woo, you know, it's not very much, but to the algae, it's, it's a lot. You know, it's way, way more than what the water needs. Okay, so from our perspective as farmers and agronomists, it's like hardly anything, but to the, to the algae, it's a big deal, which also means that, you know, we really got to stop what comes off the fields, like, you know, as much as humanly possible, because it doesn't take much to make a big issue. Okay, so we're going to um, talk more about phosphorus, how phosphorus leaves your fields. So most of the phosphorus that could leave your farm is actually in runoff. And again, soil phosphorus, you know, it doesn't tend to move very far down into your soil profile. It can, I sort of describe the situations where we do see leaching of phosphorus and what we call preferential flow through the soils. But I would say it's, you know, relatively rare, and most of the phosphorus issues we have are when phos phosphorus is transported from the surface of the soil across the field in the form of runoff and makes it into surface water. Okay, so essentially erosion, we get two kinds of phosphorus losses. The first one is what we call sediment-bound phosphorus, which essentially is phosphorus stuck to soil. Orthophosphate, the available stuff, has a negative charge. Is it attracted to your soil? No. When does it become bound to your soil? When it gets tied up by calcium or aluminum, right? Because calcium has a positive charge, it gets attracted to phosphorus, it binds that, and then it gets bound to your soil. Okay? So when phosphorus is bound to sediment, bound to the soil particle, and you get soil loss in the form of erosion, we call that sediment-bound P, sediment-bound phosphorus. So it's just stuck to soil. Okay, the second type of phosphorus where we see losses is what we call dissolved phosphorus. Dissolved phosphorus is just that orthophosphate in water. And dissolved phosphorus is a lot harder to control because it's just in water. Water can run across anything. It can run across our 100-foot buffers can run through the woods, can run anywhere. Sediment-bound phosphorus, so the soil that's moving and leaving your field, is a lot easier to stop, right? We can stop soil through having these big buffers we talk about, uh, grass waterways. We can just build stronger soils in general and keep them from moving. So much easier to control. And most of the phosphorus that we actually see leave fields is in this form. Okay, and, and quite a bit less in the dissolved form. However, if you have high soil test phosphorus fields, then you likely have a much greater chance of seeing more dissolved phosphorus leave as well. Because remember, there's, I mean, there's still a lot in your soil, so you get a lot of this too, but then there's even more free phosphorus hanging out in the soil. So sometimes you'll hear people talk about TDP, is the total phosphorus, and then you see DP, which is dissolved phosphorus. These are the two types of phosphorus we're trying to keep from leaving your field. Okay, so free phosphorus, phosphorus stuck to soil. You add those together, that's your total runoff P. So we're worried about sort of transport, so the movement of phosphorus. Essentially, if your soils are highly erodible and you have, you know, a really steep slope, no cover on the ground. You know, you guys can imagine the scenarios where you would have a lot of soil moving across your fields, right? I mean, I don't think I need to describe that. Some of it we can control. We can, some of it we don't have any control over. We can't generally change the slope of our fields, or we shouldn't be. Um, and we, you know, we can't change the type of soil that's there, but we can change our management to reduce erosion. And we can change our management to control dissolved phosphorus, too. Where we generally see a lot of dissolved phosphorus losses are in um, on hay fields. And again, I, you know, the key to stopping dissolved phosphorus because it moves in water is what? Got to make the water go down. So you don't want to have a bunch of compacted fields, crappy soil texture. But if it rains and the water goes down into the ground, then it's not moving across. And if it's not moving across, then there's no phosphorus in it. 
So the goal is to create a soil environment that is prone to infiltration instead of runoff. All right, so where does the phosphorus come from that has the potential of leaving? And we already talked about this. From the manure, from fertilizer, and then generally from the top two inches of the soil because the soil, you know, gets disassociated. Or the phosphorus can also move into water as well from the top two inches. The fixation capacity of the soil is also really important. And, you know, the more aluminum you have, the actual less chance of phosphorus loss that you have because it's more likely to hold on to it. The amount of clay that's present, again, the more aluminum, that's one benefit is that when you're calculating phosphorus losses, the more aluminum you have, generally the lower potential for phosphorus loss. And then again, the higher your soil test levels are, the greater chance risk of phosphorus loss. This is the critical level for optimum crop yields, which is in this really is four parts per million. So when you start getting above that, all that phosphorus is not really being utilized and um, has a potential for soil loss.